for the uh, reading series for today, let's talk about The Office. Let's talk about The Office, the TV show. Let's talk about The Office as a kind of um, fading relic of a, of a dying culture in America, office culture. Uh, I bring this up because, I don't know if you saw this earlier this week, um, one of my favorite authors, uh, Malcolm Gladwell, he recently came out and said that you know, work from home is essentially killing American society and it's just it's reducing your life to kind of like meaninglessness and you don't feel part of a team anymore. You don't feel like you're contributing to anything anymore, which, you know, uh, I can imagine sort of like, you know, going to an office, like if you're feeling a part of something, feeling like you're working for other people, I think is important in some way uh, to having a meaningful life. Most office jobs, even if you're in an office, certainly don't feel that way. And, you know, if Malcolm Gladwell had a two-hour commute to work, to and from work every day, I don't think he'd be, I don't think he'd be thinking about this. And also, was it a, a Chewy Dog also pointed out he was the one defending Jeffrey Tubin for jacking off on a Zoom call. So, I mean, he's like, please, jack off in the office bathroom. That's what they're there for. I feel like we never got to the bottom of that fully. Like, did he think the call had ended? I think he did. That's no, what I he think said he was anyway. just bored. That's interesting. See, that, I think do you think that's his? I think he had a billion tabs open, and one of them was the Zoom call, and like David Remnick was droning on, and the other one was like you know, uh, like Brazzers. <laughs> There's chocolate and strawberry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or no, Angela and strawberry. God damn it, I'm forgetting my references. No, nah, Jeffrey Tubin's uh, Angela and strawberry was the most softcore, softcore. Yeah, of maybe all that's time. what he likes. Maybe that's what they all like. Maybe all the media guys love softcore. <laughs> they yeah. like girl on girl. Yeah. I like Shannon Tweed scenes with socks, soft sacks. <laughs> red shoe <photo> diaries. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he had uh, red shoe diaries open. But um, Malcolm Gladwell, he's, he's, kind of, he's kind of boring. Don't really care about him. However, Peggy Noonan, my Noonan, girl, Noonan. came through with a Wall Street Journal opinion piece about um, headline, The Lonely Office is Bad for America. Employees may like remote work, but it tends to break down both organizational and national culture. So... Uh, I, I did a joke in Portland about how like they need to start shanghaiing and gang pressing people into barista and bartender service. But with this work from home stuff, eventually they're going to have to start strapping on the bayonets and just poking people back into the office. Because, you know, as Peggy said, employees like it, but it's breaking down organizational and national culture. So and also Can't have that. and also leading all these commercial leases to just be like, well, see, that's there, the yeah, thing. that's the actual thing that's yeah. undergirding all of this is that is that America at the end of the day is a real estate scam. And a big part of that is is, is office retail, downtown space and the economies that are created by it. And that, that's what generates the value of, of the residential properties around that. And you can't remove that Jenga piece without the whole thing falling over. So all this is all backfilled from there and trying to like, so that's why you get these hilarious attempts to just like, free associate any defense of the office to justify that. Well, uh, uh, what about Jim and Pam? You like that, right? <laughs> well, you want to talk about free association. Pe the, the, the gal, Peggy Noonan, is a, is a god of free association. She is, she is pure vibes. And, you know, like, I used to hate Peggy Noonan, but now I kind of like her because she's like, she's just, you know, she's barred she's up. She's out there. Out. She's, she's just, spitting. She's just spitting. She's just, just sort of jazz. She's just free-forming, bebopping, and scatting. So I kind of like Percocet Peggy. <laughs> so uh, the, the Peggy's article begins, where are we in the office wars? I think there's an armistice between the return to the office side and the work from home forces. Perhaps hostilities will resume in the fall. Bosses are hoping the old reality will snap back as the drama of 2020 through 2022 recedes. That people will start to feel they need to come back or can be made to. The work from home people are dug in believing they're on the winning side, that the transformation of work in America, which had been going remote for years, was simply sped up and finalized by the pandemic. In this tight job market, they have the upper hand. Employers are fighting for talent. Fire me, I'll get a better job tomorrow, and you'll get 50 hours with HR onboarding my replacement. The balance of power will change if the slowing economy leads to layoffs and hiring freezes. Fingers yeah. crossed. If that happens. Fingers crossed. If that happens. Oh, gee, I wonder if they're going to make that happen or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's like... Uh, well, you know, what, once say you could say like the, the two sides of this fight are not stay at work from home people or work from the office people. It's um, employees and employers. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder who's going to get the upper hand. Uh, she says the benefits from uh, benefits of working from home are obvious. Freedom. No commute. It's easier to be there for family. The dog. The dentist appointment. Less time wasted in goofy office wide meetings. I wonder if there is another aspect that office life was demystified by what began in the years before the pandemic. The rise of HR complaints and accusations of bullying, bad language, and sexual misconduct. Add arguments over masks and vaccines, and maybe office life came to be seen less as a healthy culture you could be part of, and more like a battlefield you wanted to avoid. 
Peggy Noonan believes that the the FindaCycle Office Culture of America was was a place of great mystery. <laughs> <laughs> like that there was a sort of a mystic tenor to it yeah, that was yeah. like slowly like desacralized over time. She said it was like, you know, it became less of a healthy culture you could be a part of and more like a battlefield you wanted to avoid. I mean, if there's one thing the pandemic has permanently altered about American life is that nobody likes going to the office anymore. No one likes getting up on Monday nobody and going to the going office. To nobody wants to work anymore, folks. Arguments against working from home are largely intangible, and I focus on these. They are less personal, more national and societal. I don't want to see office life in America end. The decline in office life is going to have an impact on the general atmosphere of the country. There is something demoralizing about all the empty offices, something post-greatness about them. <laughs> and almost all the, all the almost empty buildings in downtowns, it feels too much like a metaphor for decline. My mind goes first to the young. Of course it does. Peggy is always <laughs> it has her fingers on the pulse of the youth. I don't uh, know. Maybe maybe the center maybe the, the, the center business districts of giant metropolises shutting down isn't really a metaphor for decline. Maybe it just is decline, you know. Just like the actual thing itself. Uh, my mind goes first to the young. People starting out need offices to learn a profession, to make friends, meet colleagues, find romantic partners and mates. The Me Too movement did a lot of damage mentoring. Uh, the Me Too movement did a lot of damage to mentoring. Senior employees no longer wanted to take the chance. But the end of office life would pretty much do away with it. I like the idea that Me Too, <laughs> Me Too did, a lot, did a lot of damage to the mentoring system in America. Uh, uh, that ancient Greek tradition. Yeah, it was like, it's like Plato, except if uh, instead of you know, uh, Aristotle or whatever, it was a hot young woman. Yeah. They're doing fraudage. <laughs> Look, it's, it's, I'm just putting my dick between your thighs. There's no penetration yeah, it's involved. Fine. It's, it's fine. It's normal. Um, there will be less knowledge of the workplace, of what's going on, of the sense that you're part of a burbling ecosystem. I love to be there in a will burbling be, I mean, ecosystem. I mean, like, I, I feel like, the, like Malcolm Gladwell, Peggy Noonan, like, the only people, like, who talk about office culture and being in the office like this are people who have the best jobs. Right, and who have. barely yeah. go to an office. <laughs> yeah. They aren't part of any burbling in uh, system. Yeah, they, don't they burble. show up once they, or twice they a week. Burble, they burble at a maximum four to three, four to five times a month. They burble weekly at the most. And the le the last time they like, they went to an office with the ex like with the expectation of going there like five or six times a week and being someone's employee, like having a boss they answer to, was literally like forty seven years ago at this point. Yeah, yeah. like it, it might, may as well be a different country. Yeah, like yeah. they're remembering. They're remembering their times at the office, but they're actually remembering episodes of the Mary Tyler Moore show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember the day that, that, that the clown died and we all had to not laugh. It was really something. And I guess like, you know, like what we're talking here, if people with email jobs, you know, yes. people like anyone who has an email job, your job doesn't need to have an office, really. Mm -hmm. And I can understand there are benefits to going to the office. There, there are, like, I'm not saying like it's totally ridiculous, these kind of intangible things about being face-to-face -face, like we are right now, you know, like over Zoom. Sometimes a little, a little something, a little je ne sais quoi is lost. Uh, but I think like, you know, the, the benefits for a lot of people, like for instance, not having a commute, uh, being more productive and like, you know, being around your family are very real. But again, this only applies to email jobs. And the thing that I always remembered about working in an office or like any job with a real commute is that like you, you go there and you're getting paid only for the hours you're in the office. Like that's what your salary is, not for the commute. So that when you leave at the end of the day, you're just thinking like, okay, I got to get home now. And that's like another hour. And it's just this feeling of like, I will have, if I'm lucky, two hours to look at the good screen before I have to wake up and it just starts all over again. It's this feeling of like, your time is not your own. And if you're working at home, you could do work and, work and home stuff at the same time because like the big joke about most office jobs is that there's like a maximum of about three hours of work to do of a day. If you were insanely productive and drilled down and took like three Adderall, you could do all your work and it would take probably three hours like to fill an eight hour work day. Most of the time it's just people pretending to look busy. But I mean, there is an insidiousness though to the work from home thing, which it's is very true. It, it makes your home, your fucking office. Like it makes it, it, it does demystify your home. Like that is actually a zone of mystery that has been demystified by the fact that now you are like entire work life is integrated into it. Uh, I do think though that this, Pretty broad push among uh, employers and their mouthpieces to get people back into office certainly shows where capital, what capital thinks of the revolutionary potential 
and the organizing potential of email workers in an office <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Because, like, you would think that they would welcome. Oh, yeah, everyone, go to your homes. Perfect. You never see each other. You never talk to one another. This is ideal. You're never going to, like, discuss salary in the break room and give me a trouble. They clearly have weighed the, the risks, and it's like, whatever we're costing, you know, the, uh, the sweet green down the road uh, is worth more to the economy and to our numbers broadly than whether or not these people can get together and you know compare notes and their exploitation. Because at the end of the day, we don't think they're going to do anything about it. We think that they're going to be more comfortable or they're going to be more uh, grateful to have a job where they get to sit in an office and do emails yeah. than the alternative. And it's like, I can't blame anybody for, for assuming that. That's called, they're going to be burbling. They're going to burble. They're going to burble. What's the alternative folks? to burbling? Uh, just being like sort of like a like a still like sort of like a, like brackish pond. Yeah, you know. Uh, there will, as Peggy says, there will, there will be fewer deep friendships, antagonisms, real and daily relationships. Work will seem without depth, flat as a Zoom screen, less human. Without offices, you'll lose a place to escape from your home life. I mean, that is true, actually. Like, I mean, like the the, the height of like American office culture, like Mad Men. Like, yeah. the office was just a place where you could cheat on your wife. Yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I think what she's doing is she's complaining about the real nature of work revealing itself yes. over time. It's like, oh, no. Which is flat. The ritual fantasies that yes. give this illusion of depth, illusion of friendship, illusion of life and texture that are actually just this hologram on top of a dreary process of labor exploitation. Oh, no, all of the glamour is going away. What's going to be left? And I think that's what a lot of these people at the end of the day are freaking out about is that a lot of the glamours, a lot of the ritualized uh, 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 veils and screens that have gotten between us and the, like, the real nature of our uh, relationship to each other and to uh, capital and technology are being torn up, and they don't like that. They do not want people to see beyond that curtain. Now, you could argue it doesn't matter. We're too gone to do anything with this knowledge, but you know, these are people who have spent their entire life thinking that the shaping of a common beliefs and the shaping of public opinion is a worthy and meaningful goal. And so they're going to keep trying to do it. They're going to keep trying to, to, to insist that you pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. My guess is the end of the office will lead to a decline in professionalism across the oh, board. Oh, no, not professionalism. <laughs> you learn things in the hall from the old veteran. You understand she's watching your progress. You want to come through with your excellence. With her down the hall, who will you be excellent for? She's talking about herself. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, yes. Like, who will be excellent for Peggy? All I just these love, people like, I, are describing growing up in office environments when there was a, the sky was the limit. Yeah, They all were last in offices when everyone in them believed in a ladder of success that they were all, par, they, all part of. When they were paying like a freelancer like $10,000 yes. a word to like <laughs> go see a movie or something. These people lived without any sense of, of constraint. They, an assumption that every step would be a step up. I love the idea. Nobody of, working in an office now has that. I love the idea of like Peggy's career is just at every point excellence was encouraged. Yeah, like absolutely. When she was That's sorting, why we got her when she was, golden froze. When she was sorting Reagan's jelly beans for him or turning in columns. So my favorite Peggy Newton column of all time was about how Alien the Gonzalez dolphins. was aided by dolphins. dolphins coming yep. to Miami, which who were angels. Yep, the she, angel dolphins. Alien Gonzalez was saved by angel dolphins. It would have been so much funnier if the uh, if the feds had like gotten a, a dolphin in tactical gear to take him out of his <laughs> mom's house, <laughs> send him back to Cuba. <laughs> like they just strap a carabiner on him, yeah. put him to the put him in the dolphin, and just throw him in the uh, throw him in fucking Biscayne yeah. Bay. He just goes right back to Cuba, yeah. just dragging him the, the whole dolphin way. Give it the dolphin, take him away. <laughs> Day of the dolphin. Yep. Uh, Peggy continues. Uh, there will likely in each company and organization be a decline in a sense of mission. Oh, no. A diluting of company spirit looks to me inevitable. Again, all of this is a consequence of the lack of any belief in a project. No, why are you going to believe in a company that is well, just sh shrinking down your life every day? Spirit, mission. They come from people and are established and imparted through being together. Sharing a particular space. Yes, talking to each other spontaneously and privately. Encouraging and correcting. Well, I mean, I know she's going to get into television in this column, but like, let's talk about the decline in office culture and 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 sort of uh, esprit de corps and camaraderie and professionalism. There's no more water cooler shows on TV. It's true, streaming has done away with that. 
Everyone's once, once watching Gambo everything. Once Gambo was over and no one's talking about the show come Monday. Everybody watches Everyone's all the watching shows their own discrete little like and uh, their own timetables. So no one has one collective experience. It's Gambo like, is the last one. No, no, no. It's like exactly. Everyone comes to the office on the Monday and they were either watching uh, male-centered lean-in shows yep. or female-centered kind of lean-back shows. Yeah. And now they're all watching different bullshit yeah. at a different time. And then they go online to try to find people who are watching it at the same time and talk to them instead. At some point in the 20th century, America invented big-scale office life. We were the envy of the world for it. Really, were we? <laughs> <laughs> like the guys in Spain who worked like two hours a yeah. week and shit. Yeah, um, they were, were just they, like... Were they envious of American yeah. office culture? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> some guy who's like literally... He's, he's floating in a giant tub of paella yeah. on his four-hour office break from his job. Yeah. I mean, like, again, oh, if only I could be talking to Roger in accounts receivable. <laughs> I mean, again, this like only makes sense if, like, yeah, you were last in an office 45 years ago yep. and your memories are mixed with TV. Yep. Like, no, like what... What office in America is like the envy yep. of anyone, at, like anyone in a developed country? <laughs> yep. Like, uh, but yeah. like, right, it's like, but you can't, you can't address the, the the decline since then. It's just we just we lost faith in the office. That's it. Yeah, yeah. It was nothing else happened. Nothing happened to general American life or work in an office or anything else. We just lost our faith in the office as a concept. Yeah, the office because of the avocado toast. The yeah. <laughs> Um, it says, uh, we were the envy of the world for it. Without it, there will be less bubbling creativity. What less about, wait a minute. <laughs> so we got bubbling creativity and a burbling, burbling ecosystem? Burbling ecosystems, yeah. Jesus Christ. Once oh, again, what is this, is, an aquarium? She is talking about her brain. She is rolling <laughs> face right yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think she's she is all three, three weird sisters from Macbeth. <laughs> she's talking about the fucking bubbling boil. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, she's like, she's just like, uh, without it, there'll be, there won't be any burbling ecosystems. No bubbling. There won't be any bubbling creativity. No toil, and there won't no be trouble. that one really good, like, office couch that you just rub your hand in and put your <laughs> face on and you're, like, melt into it. Um, it says here, yes, less of the chance of meeting in the hall and, and the offhand comment that results in brains sparking off brains. I love to get brains. <laughs> Wait, I love to get a brain to spark off another brain. When did ever experience that? Like, <laughs> Wait, just talk, talk, talking talk to, to fucking this? Richard Cohen in the halls yeah. of the fucking Washington Post or something? Yeah, just like in 1993, like talking to some other fucking crackhead <laughs> <laughs> being like, oh, we should we should call this the, the lunchbox election. <laughs> <laughs> What are you if talking I had, about, lady? If I had run to deceive uh, at the water cooler, I wouldn't have been able to uh, put out this column about how airports aren't nice anymore. <laughs> the fucking crackhead. Like, it, it, the implicit thing here is that her work is like it's just like a supernova of creativity <laughs> yeah. over all these years. <laughs> all the all this shit that's like you know, um, de Demo Democrats have um, they have a um, a handshake gap. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's exactly, stupid bullshit. That is exactly a Peggy Noonan column. Yeah, yeah. I, I guarantee you, she has written a column like <laughs> yep. that. But it never would have happened if it wasn't those just minds just smashing off each other like the Large Hadron Collider. Yeah, just minds colliding at sublight speed and creating new particles of oh mind of mind pills. I, I should count the different. Uh, yard signs there are for the election <laughs> coming up and decide who's going to win based on that. I, th I think I need like a deficit of human contact and like and, and like I would need to be in solitary confinement doing Xanax to match your output. Yeah, that's amazing. To like write that bullshit. Yeah. Companies may seem more communal in a way. Zoom screens aren't explicitly hierarchical, but there will be less clarity and less leadership. Jamie Dimon of J.P. Morgan Chase, who has said he wants people back in the office and experienced pushback for it, just stated in his annual report that people with ambition cannot lead from behind a desk or in front of a screen. It is possible working at home is. Don't they have desks at the office though? Well, even you can't lead. For, you can't be behind the desk all day. Sometimes you have to be in the in the in playing grab ass in the hallways, and <laughs> talking about talking about gambo. Seems though, that, honestly though, if you can't lead from behind a desk, it seems like it's a bad idea to have desks in the office at all. Well, they're like, going to get rid of those. Yeah, you got to get rid of them. Standing, just, standing only. It's just like no, no more even open space office. It'll just be like one big factory floor with nothing in it, and you have it. to like sort of be on your phone. No, that's not, <laughs> that's, that's too yeah. grim. They got to do a fake thing to make it seem whimsical. A uh, ball pit. Ball pit. <laughs> just a giant ball pit. You sit in the on among the balls, and then like if you need to look at a paper or write on your laptop, it's balanced on top of the balls. 
It is possible working at home is changing the nature of professional ambition. A piece last month in the journal by the Calumbra, sorry, a piece last month in the, uh, Munch. a piece last month in the journal by Callum Borchers, okay, <laughs> cited Johnson and Johnson CEO, cited, John, ugh, cited Jonathan Johnson, CEO of Overstock.com, to foster a sense of togetherness and shared mission. He invited everyone on staff to join him for lunch every Tuesday at the company's Midvale, Utah headquarters. In eight months, in eight months, a total of ten people attended. Most of the time, I eat my peanut butter sandwich alone, Mr. Johnson told Mr. Borchers. When I was 25, if I had a chance to eat my sandwich with the CEO, I'd have been there. This motherfucker is eating a peanut butter sandwich every day. What are it's you? A, he's a Warren what Buffett you, sicko. <laughs> he's a Warren Buffett guy. Yeah, yeah. the sickest uh, of the sickos. Yeah, uh. But again, when you were 25, if like your drunk as shit boss like, takes a shine to you, like if you laughed at this Polak joke, he's like, hey, you want to be in charge of the new Asian division? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then that happens. What is going to happen from this conversation? You're going to give him some fucking homestun bullshit from Dale Carnegie or something you read in like Seven Habits of Highly Effective People and then forget his name the minute he leaves? It's also like presumably the company you were working at was like out on the up and up. This is Overstock.com. This is like a company that's been in a death spiral for 15 years. This is a company that's only been kept alive by like low interest rates. <laughs> During the Trump years, that actually would have been a, a smart... Uh, financial position to just short any company where any high level official or high any high level executive had a personal relationship with Donald Trump. Ooh, like anybody who was in the inner circle, it's like that's just that is an absolute. That's it, it's a time bomb. Like my pillow, done for. All right, here's the home stretch. Here, we're pro ambition in this space. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> Wait a minute. What space? <laughs> in in the Her mind in the, palace. In the burbling space. In the mind palace that we're trapped in. Pe Peggy's burbling brain. It, uh, we're basically in the cell. She's Vincent D'Onofrio, <laughs> and we're trapped in her burbling, her burbling ecosystem. We're pro ambition in this space. God gave you gifts. Bring them fruitfully into the world. Rise and make things better. Then again, maybe this age is making people ambitious for different things. Here are my two greatest concerns. The first is that in my lifetime, the office is where America happened each day. That's why many of our most popular TV programs there were we about the office. The good shit. From the Mary Tyler Moore show, yes. through Mad Men, yes. through, from ER, through 30 Rock, and there Parks and Recreation. Okay, ER wasn't really an office. It was a, it was a hospital. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's like a, it's a professional workplace setting, but it's, you're not doing emails unless you're an administrator. No, no, like, and, if, the, and the if, doctors if, on ER were ER, saving lives. If ER, is, if ER is an office sh sh show, then so is Law and Order. It just yeah. doesn't work. Uh, from ER through 30 Rock and Parks and Recreations. You can name others. Even MASH was a show about the workplace. No, no. a workplace. <laughs> Again, a war. not an office. Yeah. A fucking construction site is a workplace. It's not an office. And, of course, the office. Mm. Without Dunder Mifflin, how would Jim and Pam have met? How could the utterly ridiculous <laughs> Michael Scott have entered your sympathies without seeing him every day and knowing him? She, okay, so like she she just thinks TV is real. <laughs> yeah, she, she, like she is. She thinks we brought these. <laughs> these are people are tulpas that we brought to mind <laughs> psychically and gave horrible life to, and then we are now invested in. And if we stop going to the office, they'll disappear like Tinkerbell. <laughs> God, this is the kind of mind content you can only get by sparking off other minds in the office. Uh, the primary location of daily integration in America, the coming together of all ages, religions, ethnicities, and political tendencies, all colors, classes, and condition, has been during the past century the office. Uh, no, it hasn't. That's a wild. <laughs> no, that's a wild thing to say. Completely more shit. <laughs> it's I like, mean, it's another oh, one like, of those yeah. deals where it's insanely wrong. But when you consider the audience, the assumed audience for her content, then it's basically correct. It, like that is the center of the gravity of American life as these people understand it. It's where you learn to negotiate relationships with people very different from you. Where you discover Not that different. You're all in an office. <laughs> You're all wearing suits and ties. You've all gone through the same general rituals of social I mean, values and, uh, and behaviors and expectations. I mean, like you do. I mean, it's true. It's Being, a homogenizing work, space. Working any job or working an office job is about negotiating a relationship with someone very different from you, i.e. someone who owns the company or makes a lot more money than yeah, you do. Right. You negotiate your relationship with them every day based on uh, how much they're willing to give you for giving every, pretty much ev most of the time that you're awake in this life that you have, uh, making money for them. But what about Michael Scott? Well, I mean, he's sort of like, he started out as sort of a, sort, of, of, a, sort of a buffoon and kind of a, an evil, malevolent force, but then like he just... 
He melted all our hearts. God, the, the way the arc of that show is so hilarious. The way that they go, hey, the, the joke of this show is that Michael is awful and crosses boundaries and it's a nightmare to be around him. And then by the end of it, it's like, you know what? He really was the best you know, boss in the world. Like, well, you know, the show you know, literally got <laughs> Stockholm Syndrome. <laughs> I would say that the, the the office is not the primary location of daily integration in America. It's the primary location of chosen family in America. It's true, and, that is true. and friends givings. He she should have talked about friends givings. I bet they've taken a hit now. Uh, it's where you learn to negotiate relationships with people very different from you. I mean, like, what was the like huge diversity in the Wall Street Journal? Uh, yeah, opinion no, page? they're not that different. Yeah, you discern all this in the joke, the aside, the shared confidence, the rolled eyes. And with all this variety, you manage to come together in a shared formal mission. Get that account. Sell that property. Get the story. Process those claims. <laughs> I mean, like, again, you like, can if you, feel the heroism if you work, just zigging through your fucking veins it, like, yeah, with the if you, if you work for, like, a, a major newspaper, right? Like, you know, there's, like, that all the president's men thing. You can have, there is this, like, you know, like, there's, a, there's a glamorous notion and a cultural cachet to working in certain office fields. But I cannot... Processing those claims. Process the claims. <laughs> I seize the fire of Hephaestus. Daily life in America happened in the office. If it doesn't, where will America happen? <laughs> well, the, on the internet, Peggy. Exactly. The on internet. The, internet. <laughs> the answer is the metaverse. We all know yes. that now. We all know what's happening, but you're too fucking old to get the hint. And this, here's your second biggest concern. My second worry. The end of the office will contribute to polarization. Oh, no, we can't have That's any the more worst that. thing happening to America right now. We sure do. We got a lot Receding of that. Receding from office life will become another way of self-segregating. People will be exposed to less and in their downtime will burrow down into their sites, their groups, their online angers. Definitely not happening now. It's not like every interaction with somebody from your out group now is just further motivation to become more fucking sectarian and hostile. I suppose what I fear is a more disembodied nation. You can see it on the TV news. Again, she's just watching TV again. She's watching television. The empty, the empty echoing set where there used to be people at desks in the background running around. You see it in big offices when you go to see an accountant or a travel agent. There is no there. A there. Travel, travel agent. agent. <laughs> Who, who's going to see a travel agent in the last 30 years? <laughs> a travel agent. God. Throw is, that in there at the end. That's genius. This is like when Mr. Burns is checking in yep, on his yep. investments in Siam. <laughs> Am I too late for the 430 auto gyro to Prussia? <laughs> oh, God, that's so good. Disembodied isn't good. Oh. See, Pe Peggy, she really likes body hot. She likes body feeling. She doesn't like disassociating. She's, all she's, all she's, about she's the in an empty office on Xanax and ketamine. She starts disassociating. Yeah, no good. But if she's got a good body high, she's in a meeting. Yep. Jeffrey Tubin's jacking off. They're getting, <laughs> they're getting a cuddle puddle started. Dude, that that's connection. Yeah. That's burbling. She's, that's that's bodies and spaces. Yeah, she's going to take a trip down to her local office, uh, lo office park so she can... Uh, Pick up a, a big block of ice to drag back to her house. <laughs> <laughs> Disembodied isn't good. This fall and winter, I hope we see the buildings full and the people going in and out. <laughs> this is like Richard Scarry's busy town. <laughs> she just wants to sit on one of the, you know those like uh, like carpets that they have for kids that like are like a bird's eye view of a town. She wants to sit on that, but yep. it's Washington D.C. and imagine people going yep. in and all she out of little to buildings. See a little a little worm right in an apple. <laughs> Uh, I want the center of our cities to hum and thrum again. They're, they're burbling, they're buzzing, burbling, thrumming, humming humming. and thrumming. She Folks, wants a great vibrating metropolis. She, she's yeah. like Walt Clyde Frazier. It's just like, downtown Manhattan is uh, humming and thrumming again after <laughs> stumbling and bumbling through COVID. <laughs> I don't want America to look like an Edward Hopper painting. Wait, who wouldn't want to be in an Edward Hopper painting? Yeah, it's, it's the, cool. the gothic sort of quality of it. You got a it. nice hat say, on. Yeah. You got a, a dignified stare. People yeah. wonder what's in your head. I, I, so just, I don't. She wants to look like a Salvador Dali painting. The clocks are <laughs> melting again in, in Percocet Peggy's brain. Uh, he was the great artist of American loneliness. Wait a minute. He wrote. He made those paintings at the height of American office culture. It's true. So why 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 would he be expressing loneliness at a time when offices were bringing us all together, Peggy? <laughs> He was the great artist of American loneliness. Empty streets, tables for one, everyone at the bar drinking alone. We weren't meant to be a hopper painting. We were meant to be and work together. We were doing that when he made those paintings. <laughs> <laughs> that means people were still lonely because we live isolated and alienated lives under capitalism, Peggy. 
There is no coat of paint you can put on it to fix it. It's a soul deep sickness. Oh, Peggy. Pick <sighs> I'm another throw bar. In. You're fine. Yeah. So, yeah. I got to give her credit, though, for not trying to wedge in some bullshit action item or policy agenda. She just says, with like, ah, Josh, sure, sure. I sure hope they show up again. <laughs> I sure <laughs> hope I, I, could dry, I could be in my car, uh, my Uber, and I could go buy a fucking uh, uh, Hail and Hardy soup and see people out, so, out front waiting in well, line. I, I slightly disagree, Matt. I think the, the policy prescription was in there at the very beginning where she was like, I sure hope there isn't another recession. Oh, right. Yeah. That's what's yeah. going to be. Like, she's just crossing her fingers. Sure hope they don't raise those interest rates and you motherfuckers got to come back here and lose your jobs. Well, there we go. I hope, uh, I hope everyone uh, listening to this is... Um, burbling? Is burbling. I hope they're humming and thrumming in your office or home.